All right. So let's talk about how combustion takes place, right? So most of you have this, this particular five block view. I call this as a five block view because there are five components to it. So typically for combustion to take place successfully in your car or, or in your bike, you have these five elements that are interplaying with each other. The first element is your fuel, right? Your fuel is very, very important. And when I talk about fuel, I'm talking about the fuel system. So this can be your carburetor or this can be your fuel injection system. Similarly, on the air side, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about, say, you know, the, the geometry or any other valves, the throttles that are involved in taking air from the ambient inside your engine. So this is block number two. And finally, both of these two components react. When I say react, they interact basically to control the fuel and air mixture quality, right? So what do I mean by mixture quality? Well, is my air and fuel mixed very well? Is it, is it mixed okay -ish or it's, is it not at all mixed? How do I quantify this? How do I put a number that can tell me that, okay, if my air fuel mixture variable is this much, it means everything is mixed perfectly, else it's not. What is, how can I quantify it? <laughs> Similarly, combustion. Uh, finally, depending upon your type of engine, whether it's a spark ignited engine or a compression ignition based engine, your combustion event changes, right? And then finally, when combustion takes place, your fuel and air is going to result in uh, products which you call as emissions, correct? So this is what I call as a simplified diagram. Now in the simplified diagram, if you are able to optimize even a single system, <coughs> meaning for example, let us say that you are able to optimize the process of creating fuel and mixture. That means you are taking a step forward towards optimizing an IC engine. I hope that makes sense. So for example, if you make the mixing process more efficient, then yes, you can get some uh, advantages in reducing emissions and also gaining some performance improvements. But what does making the mixing process more efficient even mean? Fuel injection, okay, that's good. Fuel injection definitely makes the mixing process more efficient because it atomizes, it helps in better atomization of the fuel. So even if you, your fuel amounts or air amount changes, mixing is completely different. Nira Vyas, the mapping in ECU which decides the intake time. Well, you need to understand that ECU is just a controller. It basically looks at your exhaust O2 and then tries to modify your fuel injection accordingly. But even then your mixing process can be inefficient. I'm just talking about what you can do to make the mixing process more efficient. Well, so this is where the concept of port design comes in, right? So if you're taking a gasoline engine, most likely a GDI engine, or a, or a direct injection engine, then these are being devised for something called as a tumble flow, right? I'll talk about what tumble means shortly, but that is a particular type of flow pattern that is beneficial, all right? And similarly, if you take a look at uh, diesel engines, then you have something called as the helical port, which helps in generating more swirl, which is beneficial. How about increasing or decreasing the compression of the piston? that might that might have a benefit but again if you're talking about mixing more than the compression of the piston the piston bowl shape is more important or shit so that is a, that would be a valid answer but not the compression alone will definitely affect the mixing process but it is not going to be a deal breaker say such as using a flat piston versus using a re-entrant bowl correct so the piston bowl design or the combustion chamber design is very important. Yes, that helps in your mixing process. Similarly, combustion, right? If you're able to make the combustion more efficient, then, you know, things will be better. But that's the question, right? Whenever you're talking about making things efficient, you always need to, you know, engineer it, engineer the problem. Meaning, see, for example, say that, you know, you are basically uh, working with some type of a system, right? And you're trying to optimize it, all right? So the question is, <laughs> when you're trying to optimize it, you need a performance metric. Say, say that you're designing a vehicle and you're trying to optimize your suspension system, right? You can tighten the springs, 
and you can modify your dampers and you can change your camber, caster, tow in, tow out, all that stuff. But how would you measure the performance of the vehicle, right? There has to be a, per per a particular metric. What would that metric be? Well, how fast can I, how fast can I complete a particular lap, right? That is a metric. So there is the, the metric that you're looking for is the time, correct? Time to finish a particular race. But how do you put a metric for combustion efficiency, right? Because it is a geometric parameter, right? It is just the ratio of volumes. How does that make your combustion more efficient? When you're talking about efficiency, right? Isn't there something like 50% efficiency, 60% efficiency? How do you measure that? By measuring the brake power available. How do you measure combustion efficiency alone, right? So when we talk about brake power, there are other factors that are coming in as well. But how do you isolate the work that is being done only during the combustion? Well, you can do something called as an energy balance and then figure out what is the rate at which heat is being released inside the engine, correct? So for example, if this is theta, your crank angle, and if this is pressure, if you take a look at a diesel engine, then the pressure curve is going to look something like this. So this is what you call as a P theta diagram, right? You might have heard of it. Whenever people are designing an engine, this is something that they look at because the area under this curve gives you the power, gives you the power output and the rate at which the work is being done. Uh, you know, sorry, the, the area under this curve basically gives you the power output of this engine, which is very, very important. And obviously you can get the torque as well because you have the RPM as well. Now, if you look at this P theta, basically what's happening is compression is taking place and then suddenly there's an increase in pressure because of combustion, correct? So on the same graph, maybe I'll use a different color and let's do a Y2 axis. So I'm just going to do a Y2 axis here and I'm going to plot something called as HR, which stands for heat release. Maybe I'll use green color so that it makes it more distinguishable or discernible. So what's going to happen is initially you're doing your compression stroke, there's no heat release. So heat release is zero. And then just before, uh, since this is a diesel engine, there is going to be an ignition delay, right? Suddenly there is going to be a heat release. It's called as a pre-mixed heat release spike. And then there is a heat release profile and then the heat release dries, uh, dies down. This is called as the heat release rate, HRR. The unit for heat release rate is joule per degree or joule per theta. What you can do is you can integrate this curve and calculate something called as IHR, which is called as the integrated heat release rate which basically says what is the total amount of heat that is being generated just from the combustion process. Now, if you're measuring the brake power, like measuring the work done, then the frictional losses are all gone, right? You're, you're taking into account the loss because of the friction. But what we are basically doing is we are, we are, we are forgetting the friction. We are so, sorry. We are forgetting the friction component and we're basically saying, Hey, I have this much amount of fuel. How am I combusting that efficiently? That for that indicated, sorry, integrated heat release rate is what is important. What I can then do is I can take the integrated heat release rate. I can divide that by the total energy that I have at my disposal. What is that? Well, I can take the mass of fuel that I have and I can multiply that by the lower heating value of the fuel. This would be called as the combustion efficiency, <coughs> excuse me, right? So what the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, as engineers who want to learn CFD, make sure that you first understand these fundamental parameters, because if you don't understand these fundamental parameters, then it's going to be very hard for you to come up with strategies that can help optimize the engine. Finally, we have emissions, right? So emissions is basically something that is controlled by chemical reactions and a sound understanding of chemical kinetics is required in order to, you know, completely understand how your reactants, which is air and fuel are converted to products.